Okay. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I have the solutions up here, but um, I guess what I would like to know by, uh, by your feedback is, um, are there any parts of the pr problem where you got stuck? That's the part that you you're want, want to be interested in, too. Wh which part was the, the part that you got, if you got stuck on it? What, what, what did you get stuck on? No, which well, is the light. I'm sorry? Oh, the, the light. Okay, what is the color of the light? Okay. And how about on the electron side of things? Just like keeping track of all the units, making sure you're using the right thing. The right, the right units for the constants. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's. Yeah, this is what I like. Yeah. 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 Because you have two. There's two different versions of Planck's constant. They're both equivalent to each other, but you have to use the, the correct units. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, good, good point to know. Um, let's start with the the um, the uh, photon solution first. So again, we're comparing the the wavelengths of photons and electrons. A typical photon with a typical electron. Uh, so uh, um, with the photon, you can calculate the energy using Planck's uh, uh, Planck's law. So the energy is equal to h times the frequency. Um, the light has a frequency of 6 times 10 to the 14th hertz. That's what you're given in the problem. And notice that this is in seconds. Um, Planck's constant here is also given uh, in seconds. So this is, uh, um, uh, uh, this is a version of Planck's constant, uh, which is joules times seconds. The units for this is joules times seconds. So you know what, let me, let me just make a, a correction to the note. Not a correction, but just... Um, a clarification that this meter squared per kilogram of second is also joules um, is also equal to joules times seconds because that will help you um, so 6.63 times 10 to the negative 4 joules times seconds times uh, uh, 6 times 10 to the 14th per second so uh, um, the joule the the seconds cancel and you're left with just 4 times 10 to the negative 19 joules that's the energy of a typical light at 500 nanometers. Uh, oh, the, the calculation of the, the wavelength is just C over F. So C is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by the frequency, and that gives you 500 nanometers. So 500 nanometers light has uh, four times 10 to the negative 19 joules of, of energy associated with it. And you could also calculate this in terms of electron volts. As you'll see in this particular class, we use electron volts more than we do joules. But for this particular calculation, it's done in joules. So for the electron, we have to use the classic particle equations to find the velocity and the wavelength. So this is going to be broken up into two parts. So if we, when we want to find the energy of the electron, or when we want to find the velocity of the electron, we're given the energy and we have to back calculate the velocity. So when we deal with electrons, uh, we use this thing called an electron gun. If you want to generate electrons, you have to, you have to use an electron gun, which basically is like, it's like a wire. Um, it's a wire in vacuum, and when you run current through the wire, it actually shoots off electrons by something called, like thermionic emission. All right. and. Um, the energy that the electron has is related to how much uh, uh, voltage potential that you put on the electron to accelerate it. Okay, remember I showed you the, the parallel plates and I said the more electric field you have, the more energy, more potential energy you have? That's exactly the case here. So, you know, with, with an electron, we put, it, we put the electron in, a, in an electric field and we know that it's going to accelerate to a certain speed. Like, we know that it has a certain potential energy because we know the voltage that we put across the plates. That's called the acceleration potential, but it's, just, it's the exact same thing. It's just a parallel plate. You put a voltage on there to accelerate the electron. So you have an energy, and that energy is something that you can, um, that, that was part of your experiment, um, that uh, the energy was 10 kilo electron volts, so it's 10 times 10 to the third electron volts. Let, let me back up for a second. So the process is you use E equals mv squared. You know the E, so you're gonna solve for the V. And so the velocity is equal to uh, 2e divided by m, and you plug in the numbers here, and uh, your energy is going to be 10 uh, times 10 to the 3 electron volts. And as you mentioned, what was your name again? Asma. Asma. A Esma or Asma? Asma. 
Asma. Okay. So Asma, as Asma said, like the units are, are critical here, right? Because you're you're given that the energy is in electron volts, and so um, uh, uh, we multiply by. Um, uh, sorry, this is two e divided by. Oh yeah, the the e is given in terms of el electron volts. You multiply by uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 volts per electron volt. Okay, this is for you to be able to um, uh, do a unit conversion. Okay, because uh, the well, no, volts per electron volt. Correct. So you then you divide by uh, the the mass here, uh, 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31, and that will give you the the meters per second, how fast the electron is moving. Um, okay. Now, uh, this wavelength here, you calculate the wavelength um, by using the de Broglie equation. And so the H is the Planck's constant. And the, so this is given in uh, joules times seconds, or you know, this is a long form of that. And then you divide by the uh, kilograms and the velocity here, uh, the velocity that you calculated earlier here. And that gives you a, um, a wavelength of 1.2 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, meters. <clears throat> so what does that mean if we compare 500 nanometers, which is... Um, green, is it green light? Yeah, so the photon, you know, the photon was 500 nanometers, 500 times 10 to the negative 9. So 5 times 10 to the negative 7 meters is the wavelength of the photon. The wavelength of the electron is 1 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. It's about four orders of magnitude smaller. All right, so it's much, 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 much tinier. Uh, okay, so any questions on this? The units can, can, be, can trip you up a little bit sometimes here. Um, was there a typo here? Um, um, this is units of energy. Uh, okay, one correction here. Can you please make this correction in your notes? This should be joules here, not volts. Joules per electron volt. Okay, this, let me just point, point this out here. I just realized it afterwards that that V should be a J. Um, this, uh, 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 this is an energy conversion. So the energy, this E, you've been given the E in terms of um, electron volts, okay? And if you want to do calculations in the MKS system, then you have to convert it to joules. One electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Okay, sorry for that confusion. I just realized that it's uh, the wrong units there. All right, there are two units of energy. Electron volts is for representing very small, uh, very small amounts of energy. So uh, that's why this uh, uh, the joule is the typical MKS unit for energy. So in this particular calculation, we were doing everything in terms of um, we, the conversion was to change everything into the MKS units. Okay, so um, as a result of this, you see that there's a huge difference in uh, 500 nanometers which is 5 times 10 to the negative 7 meters versus 1 times 10 to the negative 11 meters, four orders of magnitude difference. All right, And uh, one of the implications of that is uh, a, way for, a way for us to do imaging. So this is a, a practical application of the calculation that you just did earlier. Um, some of you have probably heard of scanning electron microscopes. Have, has, any, has any of you ever seen a scanning electron microscope? All the material science guys, of course. <laughs> so, did you see the one in chemistry? You guys use the one in chemistry? Yeah, one at work. Oh, you have one at work. Awesome. Where did you say you work again? DS Imaging and Plastics. 
Oh, okay. You guys use the SEM to image the structure of plastics that you generate? Nice. Very, very cool. Okay, so you guys are familiar with uh, uh, the scanning electron microscope. So you might find interesting why electrons are used, uh, if you don't already know, is uh, if you're trying to image something, um, to image with high resolution, you want to use a wave with a small wavelength. And that has to do with this concept called Rayleigh dispersion, which uh, we, we won't get into all the details of it, but this is the, all I want you to know is that uh, the Rayleigh scattering law, it tells you that the smallest object you can see with, you know, how do we image? We, we usually bounce waves off something, right? When I'm looking at my hand here, what's happening is that light, visible light is bouncing off my hands and it's entering my eyeball, right? Um, so what, when we're imaging, we're looking at waves bouncing off objects and then coming to a detector. And in this case, my eyeball is a detector. Rayleigh's scattering law tells us that the smallest object that you can see with a certain wavelength uh, of the wave that you're imaging with is just a fraction of the wavelength. It's, it's sometimes a wavelength over two, it's a wavelength over four, um, you know, kind of de depending on the system. But it's like it's a fraction of the wavelength. Okay, so with with uh, um, with green light, the one we just figured out earlier, what's the smallest thing that we could image with green light? So five hundred nanometers. Four hundred. Yeah, a fraction a fraction of like half the wavelength is something a rule of thumb that people often use. The smallest object we could possibly see with, with for imaging with green light is is uh, which has five hundred nanometer wavelength. The smallest thing we could see is around two fifty nanometer due to the Rayleigh scattering law. Practically speaking, like you can't even get that much. There's, there's some really cool new techniques called super resolution microscopy that goes beyond the Rayleigh diffraction limit, but that's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. So um, if you want to work within the Rayleigh scattering limits, then what you can do is uh, um, you can use electrons instead of photons because they have a much smaller wavelength. Now the, the electron we said like 1 times 10 to the negative 11 meters, right? That's the wavelength of an electron. So the Rayleigh scattering law would tell us that you could image something that's like 0.5 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Much, much smaller. This is the reason why electrons are used for high resolution microscopes rather than photons. Um, and, you know, I, I think that some of you have seen pictures of this. So this is a, a picture of a, an insect eyeball, a compound eye. I don't know if you have, like, insects actually have tons of eyes that go off. That's part of, we only have one, but they have a bunch. Um, these are SEM images comparing uh, an optical microscope image with an SEM image of uh, really small nanofibers. Uh, you can see that the SEM does a lot better in terms of uh, resolution and imaging capability. And this is just because of the Rayleigh scattering law. Uh, so you use electrons for imaging. Um, the way that a scanning electron microscope works is that you have something that emits electrons, an electron gun, and you shoot the electrons, you accelerate your electrons towards the object that you want to image. Electrons will bounce off the image, and then you have electron detectors that de detect, uh, detect the electrons. And um, w one of the key differences between light imaging and electron imaging is that you know, with electrons, you have to actually raster scan the electrons. Um, you, you take a beam of electrons and you actually go back and forth. Whatever you're trying to image, you raster scan the electrons over what you're trying to image, and then you measure the, the, um, the electron detected signal versus time, and you create an image out of that. So, you know, it, it's a lot of the details which are, are not um, you know, beyond the scope of this class. I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. But um, the point here is electrons have a smaller wavelength than photons, and one of the uh, applications of that is the scanning electron microscopes, which, um, which are used quite heavily nowadays in, in science, in nanoscience and technology. All right. So... So now we're going to get, uh, I mentioned that this photon versus electron thing was a bit of an aside. Now we're going to talk about uh, finding the uh, locations of the electrons. So this gets at the Schrodinger equation. So electrical behavior of a material, we want to know where the electrons are and how they behave. That will tell us 
how the material behaves electrically. Um, so uh, electrons are responsible for the electrical properties of a material. We want to know the electronic configuration, where the electrons are, how they behave. And what we're going to find is that electrons are governed by this wave-like behavior um, when it comes to these, the, the electron configuration in atoms, in individual atoms, and also in lattices. And that's where the wave-like behavior is going to be described by the Schrodinger equation. Um, a little bit of history and, and an important uh, principle that was discovered also in the um, in the 1920s is, uh, um, I think it's the 1920s, it's, it's a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This is uh, an important relationship in modern physics that states that it's impossible to simultaneously measure the momentum and the exact position of an electron. Um, and, it's, and, and a corollary of that is that it's also impossible to measure the energy of an electron at, at an exact time. Uh, this is a picture of, of Heisenberg and this was an important rule um, that I would say it makes things um, more challenging. It, it makes uh, the behavior of things in, in, at the quantum domain at really small length scales different than the classical domain. If you think about um, you know, the, your classic experiment that we talked about with the tennis ball, the equations tell you the exact position of the tennis ball at any given time, right? You know the exact position of the electron. So that's classical mechanics. Quantum mechanics says that you can never know the, um, uh, the momentum of the tennis ball and the position of the tennis ball at the exact same time when you're at those length scales. And if it doesn't make sense to you here, it'll actually kind of make sense to you when we start talking about wave packets. Uh, I'll just mention briefly about wave packets just to give you an intuition of why this uncertainty comes about. Um, have, have any of you heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle before? Okay. Has it ever made sense to you? <laughs> a little bit? As a sentence, sure. As a sentence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the first time, yeah, you read this, and you says, oh, yes, you can't possibly measure the um, momentum and the exact position of an electron. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff underneath that, that sentence that, that, um, that takes, like, you know, years to understand. We're not going to understand all the details of that. We're just going to understand some very basic parts of it. Okay. Um, this position uncertainty, uh, delta x, and the momentum uncertainty, delta p, um, is always going to be greater than Planck's constant over 4 pi. Uh, similarly, if you're looking at energy uncertainty, the delta e, which is measured in joules, and the delta t, which is um, measured in time, uh, that is the uncertainty of the energy measurement. So if you're trying, you can't simultaneously measure the um, the time of the energy measurement and um, the energy itself. Uh, just a, a word on on units. Remember, Planck's constant can be given in joules times second. So e times t. This is joules, and this is seconds. And uh, Planck's constant can also be you know decomposed into the kilograms, meters, and such. And so this equation is also equivalent. Um, this, is a, this is a cartoon that one of the students in uh, uh, 4570 posted. I thought it was kind of cool. Electron is proton. Where the hell are you? Oh, <laughs> that's stuffy. <laughs> I can tell you where I probably am. Does that help? And this is exactly what quantum mechanics is all about. Um, we can't say exactly where an electron is, but we can give a probability that an electron exists in a certain region. Okay. And when we start playing games like that, it's not a game, it's, it's just, it's the, it's how it, how it is, we have to use something called probability density functions. And so that's what I'd like to go into, uh, go into next. Again, it, um, you know, some of these are concepts that you may have learned about in previous classes on probability, but, you know, quantum mechanics ties in a lot of stuff together, so I, I think it's helpful to just, you know, touch on some of these, um, you know, what these things are really quickly so so you um, so you understand so we're going to talk about discrete versus continuous probability density functions and so just think back to if you took a class on probabilities at some point in time or just if you go to the if you go to the casinos and you already know a lot about probabilities 
So if I roll a die, uh, um, DeMarco, if I roll a die, what's the probability of rolling a four? Six, like uh, it's just one die. Oh, one die. Uh, yeah, just one die. That has six sides. One over six. One over six. One over six. six. That's right. There's six possibilities, and the four represents one of those six possibilities. So the answer is one sixth. All right. This is a discrete probability density function. Uh, this, or it's a discrete probability. Discrete means that you can only have a limited number of possible outcomes. All right, let's say I pick any integer between 1 and 10. What's the probability of choosing a 6? 1 10. Close. This is a bit of a trick question. Uh, 2 and 3, 4 and uh, 2 and 3. Uh, just 1 or? Well, um, so we're picking, any, we're picking any integer, right? Um, how many possibilities are there? So, yeah, to pick twice a time or once? Uh, once. 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 Oh, wait. I, so no, no, no. It wasn't a trick that? question. It was not a trick question. I'm sorry. I'm making it more complicated than it is. It's, there's 10 possibilities and 6 is one of the 10 choices. I'm so sorry. Um, the, the possibility, the, the, uh, it's one, one tenth is the probability here. All right. Now, the difference between a discrete probability function, uh, probability density function or discrete probability versus a continuous probability is, is, Illustrated by this. So now instead of saying I'm going to pick an integer between 1 and 10, I'm going to say I'm going to pick a rational number between 1 and 10. Any rational number between 1 and 10. And now what is the probability of picking a 6? A rational number is infinitely small. It's infinitely small. That's correct. Because when we're talking about rational numbers, we're talking about any decimal number, right? There's any, any, any infinite number of combinations that you could choose between 1 and 10. So the number of possibilities on the denominator goes to infinity. So the probability of choosing a 6 is basically 0. All right. So this is an example of a continuous probability. All right. The real world, well, I should say, the, the, the continuum world works on continuous probability density functions. Um, there are some cases where you, know, you can start playing with discrete probability density functions. But um, let me ask a, a, another question here. All right, so this is a case where we have non, a zero probability. Now, how do we get a non-zero probability? We say something like this instead. We say, let's say I pick any rational number between 1 and 10. What's the probability of choosing a number between 6 and 7? So that's the difference. Instead of saying, what's the probability of choosing 6? What's the probability of choosing a number between 6 and 7? It's big, but still we can limit it between 6 and 7. Yeah, there, it's, it's a non-zero probability. It's like 1 in 10 ends up being? Uh, 1 in 10, it's, it's actually 1 in 9. It's actually 1 in 9 because if you take 10 minus 1, yeah. the difference between 10 and 1 is 9. And so this is, um, you know, the, the, the probability of choosing a number between 6 and 7 is it's 1 ninth of that space. Okay, this will make more sense if we just like, we just draw draw this out here. All right, um, let me just put, yeah. So uh, a continuous probability density function, like the ones we just talked about, uh, the probability of finding an electron. Now we're not talking about numbers anymore. We're going to change the discussion back to electrons. The probability of finding an electron at a specific location, like right at 6, right at x equals 6, the probability is 0. If we want a non-zero probability, we have to integrate the probability density function over a range. Um, and this will give us the probability of finding an electron in a specific region. So as a one-dimensional example, so p of e, the probability of finding an electron is the integral from x1 to x2 of p of x dx. So this is your probability density function, p of x. And you're just integrating that function between x equals one, uh, x1 and x2, the range that you're looking for the electron. All right, and remember, um, integration is just looking at the area under the curve. So if we just take a few, you know, non-calculation examples, we just kind of look at this geometrically. The, if we take a uniform probability density function, a uniform PDF is where there's equal probability everywhere. No bias. The electron can be found in any part you know, anywhere between here and the wall, and there's no bias to it. 
uniform probability density function. What is the probability that an electron exists between x equals 4 and x equals 5? Um, the answer is, you know, you take the you take the integral of this function. So you're looking between x equals 4 and x equals 5. So you're going to take the integral of this function between 4 and 5. All right, and the integral is just the area under the curve. This function happens to have a value of 1 fifth, so 1 fifth is the height here. And what's the width? 1. one. So the area here is 1 fifth. All right, so that's the answer. There's a 20% probability of finding an electron between x equals 4 and x equals 5. What's the probability of finding an electron between x equals 0 and x equals 5? 100%. It's the probability of finding an electron between x equals 0 and x equals 5. This is what we refer to as the entire domain. Right, the probability function, the probability density function exists over a domain between x equals 0 and x equals 5. The probability of finding an electron in, over the entire domain is always equal to 100%, 1. Okay? Because the electron has to exist somewhere. So this is an, this is an example of a non-uniform probability density function. This is a more realistic case. Because um, due to the atomic structure, let's say I'm the nucleus, right? And the electron, the electron, uh, the probability density function between myself and the wall over there. The electron is actually going to want to be a little bit closer to me because I'm a positive charge and the electron's a negative charge and there's some attractive forces there, right? The reality is the mathematics behind that are a little bit more complicated, but that's the way that you can initially think about it. It's, it there is an electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the, and the electron, right? So in that case, it's going to be a non-uniform probability density function. Um, there's going to be a high probability that an, that an electron happens to be in this region, a lower probability that the electron is further away. All right, and wherever the PDF has a large value, there's a high probability of finding an electron in that region. So um, in this case, what is the probability that the electron is between x equals 4 and x equals 5 in this case? Zero. zero. Right, because the PDF function is zero here. If you were to integrate the area under the curve between 4 and 5, there's no area, so it's zero. So um, you know, if the, the probability that the, uh, that the electron is between x equals 1 and x equals 4, Yeah, close to 100%. But right? beside the, the, the PX, like the, the graph in the second one. Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? How did we decide like it's going to look like this? Oh, how Actually, do we decide? That's the good. I, I just drew an arbitrary function. Okay. There's no mathematical function here. I'm just trying to give you intuition. But these are the types of functions that are the solutions to the Schrodinger equation. What, it, to answer your question, if we want to find out what this PDF is that tells us where the electron is likely to be, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation will give us this PDF, the probability density function. All right, so that's the intuition behind the Schrodinger equation. So um, that's good because that, that uh, leads us to this, um, you know, we're talking about the wave functions. So we can't determine the precise location of an electron. But we can, what we can do is define a wave function, kind of like these PDFs that we've been talking about, that tells us the probability of finding an electron within a volume that we specify. Now, these examples happen to be one-dimensional probability density functions. Okay? They only tell us about the x-coordinate. But we could have three-dimensional probability density functions in x, y, and z that actually tells us the probability of finding an electron in three dimensions, which is the real world. The real world is in three dimensions. <clears throat> um, so the wave function, Schrodinger, the solution to the Schrodinger equation is a wave function that tells us the probability density of finding an electron in, in a particular region. And the way that the wave function is defined is as follows. Um, the, uh, the probability of finding an electron inside a particular volume. So this orange uh, box here is a volume, some arbitrary volume, and there's an electron inside of it. The probability that the electron exists inside that box is equal to this uh, triple integral here, 
All right, remember in, in, the, in the previous slide, we, we, had, we only had to do a one-dimensional integral. But since we're in three dimensions now, we have to do a, a three-dimensional integral, dx, dy, dz. That's the first point. The second point is um, the way that the wave function is defined, it's, um, the probability is actually equal to the int integral of the absolute value of psi squared. Okay, uh, Psi is, a, is the variable for the wave function. Uh, the way that it's defined is that you actually, to find the probability, you have to square the psi function and then find the integ integral of that. All right, subtle but very important point. This next point here is the point that, uh, that we just made earlier, that if you were to integrate the probability density function over the entire domain, uh, then the probability would be 1. So if we look at all possible values of x, all possible values of y, all possible values of z, and we integrate over the, the infinite three-dimensional space, then the probability of finding an electron is 1, right? All right. I thought the probability had to be less than 1. Um, well, if, if we integrate over the entire space, then the, then the probability is equal to 1. It can't be greater than 1. The probability cannot be greater than 1. And probabilities are always less than 1. So more, more details about the wave function. All right. Um, the, the wave function is going to indicate the behavior of a wave-like particle. All right. Um, so this is describing the wave-like behavior of an electron. Remember, electron behaves as a particle, photoelectric effect. It also behaves as a wave. And the de Broglie equation helps us understand what the, what the wavelengths are for that electron. But we need to go beyond that now and look at w how we can use that to figure out where the electron is. And there's some cool but subtle points here that we, we should know. Um, first of all, the wave function indicates the behavior of a wave-like particle. Um, wherever psi happens to be large, at some point x, there's a high chance of finding an electron there, um, psi squared. Right? But psi and psi squared are kind of related. So wherever you have a large value of psi, then there's also a large value of psi squared. So there's a, a high probability of finding an electron at that particular location. This is what a typical wave function might look like. And I'll get into this on the next slide. Um, so some of the rules for wave functions. No two electrons can have the same wave function. Okay. Uh, so that means like when we solve for a whole bunch of electrons, like silicon has like 14, uh, 14 electrons in it, that means there's 14 different wave functions. So we wouldn't do Schrodinger's equation against, let's say, an electron being shot out of a scanning electron microscope, but we would do it for an electron attached to an atom. No, you can do it for both. The question was, can you, can you find the wave function for a free electron? Um, or can you find the uh, uh, wave equation for an electron that's bound to a lattice or, for, or bound to a single hydrogen atom? The answer is yes. You can find the wave function for all of those cases. The wave function is um, a function that describes the behavior of an electron for a particular what we call boundary condition. The three situations that you described there, they were all different boundary conditions. That's, we'll get that, into that with the Schrodinger equation. No two electrons can have the same wave function. Um, psi and its spatial derivative, the, the, the spatial derivative, meaning the gradient of the, of the wave function, are both continuous. Um, the reason for this is if you had a discontinuity in the wave function, it would imply infinite energy. Uh, so this is the rule that we just have to remember. They're continuous functions. Um, it's also a complex function. Complex function means it has real and imaginary parts. Just like you know when we talked about phasors and circuits 1 and circuits 2, you had real and imaginary parts. Um, this, the, the psi is, uh, is a complex function that represents the amplitude and the phase of a wave. The reason we use complex numbers is it's a compact way uh, to represent both amplitude and phase um, in, a single, um, in a single function. Um, as I mentioned before, the probability amplitude, the, the likelihood of finding an electron at a specific location, is given by uh, the absolute value of psi squared, which is actually equal to the psi times its complex conjugate, psi squared. All right, and we'll talk more about this um, later. Um, more intuition, though. Um, 
you know, back when we, you know, at the beginning of today, we, we talked about waves. We said, oh, electrons behave as waves. Um, and then we started saying, well, we're interested in finding the location of the electron. Where, can, where are we most likely to find the electron? And so uh, there's uh, a question that may come up in your heads is like, how can a wave represent, how can a sinusoid represent the location of an electron? And the answer is, is that it can't. A single sinusoid is, is not really good at doing that. Two-dimensional, because it's two-dimensional? Uh, it, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me just put it this way. Let's say this was a psi function, okay? Let's say this was a wave function. Uh, where is there a high probability of finding an electron? In five spots, or Nine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, the the probability of finding an electron is it's large here, it's large here, it's large here, it's large here, it's large here. If this wave went on forever and ever, then you don't really have a good idea of where your electron is, right? I mean, it can be anywhere of one of those one of those spots. So that doesn't really help us narrow down the location of an electron. Um, but this is where Fourier series comes in handy. So a single sine wave described by sine or cosine doesn't do a good job of indicating the electron because this, the, it could be uh, wherever the sinusoid is high, that's where there's a high probability of finding an electron. That doesn't really help us out. But remember um, is that when you start adding up sinusoids in a Fourier series, you can start to make other functions. Uh, what we'd like to do is um, we'd like to have a pulse function, you know, like uh, If our, if our psi function looked like this, if this was x and this was our psi function, we'd like to have a pulse because a, a pulse would tell us that there's a high probability of finding, finding an electron in this region and, it, and it's zero everywhere else. Right? So between the baseband filter, right, wherever you think the uh, electron is going to be? You're, you're thinking along the correct lines. Um, we don't need to worry about filtering yet, but just think back to filtering is related to Fourier series, yeah. right? So if, if you add up a whole bunch of sinusoids, as, as is shown here, this is the, the link to the hyperphysics page is, is here. This is a great website. Hyperphysics is a great website for this kind of stuff. Um, if you add up a whole bunch of sinusoids that have slightly different wavelengths and wave numbers, uh, you can end up with a function that looks like this. Now, this function is called a wave packet. Uh, meaning it has it, it starts to look more like a pulse function, and this tells us that that the 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 probability of finding an electron in this in this region is high. The probability of finding an electron out here is lower. Right? And you can make that wave you can make that wave packet really really narrow. The more sinusoids that you add up. In order to um, do you guys remember this that like if you want to make a sh very sharp pulse, if you want to make a delta function. Um, how many wavelengths do you need to add up? Infinite. Infinite. Yeah. The the more the if you the the sharpest function the the function that has the most frequency components is what's called a delta function. It's basically a very sharp pulse, and that pulse has all the frequency components. Meaning you have to add up sinusoids of all frequencies in order to get the delta function. All right ton of uh, sinusoids that you need to, to create the, a pulse function. That, that's the function that can tell you the exact position of an electron. So this, uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because this relates back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. When you use a ton of sinusoids um, to express the location of an electron, you have an uncertainty in the wave number. The more sinusoids you're adding up, each sinusoid has a wave number associated with it, right? So if you're adding up all sinusoids of all different wave numbers, your uncertainty in the wave number is really high. But when, in that situation, like when you added up all those sinusoids, then you got a pulse function as the, the they summed up to a pulse function, and the pulse function gives you a really good uh, um, estimate of where the location where the where the electron is located. So the position of the electron, the position uncertainty becomes very small, but the momentum uncertainty, which is related to the wave number, becomes very large.
That's one case. The other extreme is the one that we mentioned, mentioned earlier, where you just add one sinusoid. A single sinusoid has a single wave number. So your uncertainty in the wave number goes to zero. But when you use a single sinusoid to represent an electron, the uncertainty in the location is infinite because it can be anywhere along that sinusoid. That is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle explained in simple mathematical terms. That's what's being, uh, that's what's being shown uh, here. All right. Um, these equations up here, this is an equation for a single traveling wave. This is a sum of uh, traveling waves. Uh, the wave packet is a, a sum of sinusoids, like I said. The location, you can create a pulse out of that, and the, the pulse can actually move in time. There's some, you know, you can find some cool videos of like these wave packets like moving, uh, moving in, uh, in space and stuff. You can see that. But basically, these wave functions are being used to describe, um, describe the position of electrons. Okay? All right. Um, oh, wow, 710 already. Um, okay. So what we're going to do next time, um, this leads directly into the Schrodinger equation. So we've talked a lot about wave functions now. What we're going to do in Wednesday's class is we are going to look at the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is a law that describes the energy of an electron. And um, basically how we use it is that if you're given a potential field V, you can use that potential field to calculate the wave function. Um, so where does the potential function, potential field comes from? It's what David, you mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Let's say you have an atom. An atom has a nucleus. A nucleus has a positive charge associated with it, so it has an electric field associated with it. And it has an electrostatic potential field, a V. So that gives you, that the fact that you have that nucleus gives you the V. The V is a boundary condition for the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is a differential equation. You have to plug in boundary conditions into, the, into any differential equation if you want to solve it. So the V gives you the boundary condition. That allows you to solve for psi, the wave function, and that wave function in turn tells you the location of the electron. So that's how, um, it doesn't just tell you the location of the electron, it also tells you a bit about the behavior of the electron. So this is you know, quantum mechanics in, um, in a nutshell. Uh, and we'll talk, we'll get into some of the details of the Schrodinger equation um, on Wednesday's class. Okay, great, thank you. Two questions, Professor. I was sure. wondering, um, 